what is going on today guys welcome back to the channel and today's video where we are starting a brand new series now this is something i've wanted to do for quite a while now doing drift media obviously at all the different drift events across the years i've always wanted to do something where i spotlight either drivers or teams or just interesting people in the community in general that way i can hopefully shed a light onto kind of our local culture and also just drifting in general because i think all too often we kind of get wrapped up in the cars and uh you know that's what you really know you don't really know the person behind it what inspires them what got them into drifting etc that's always been interesting to me as i meet more and more people in the community and i shoot more and more cars along with driving myself so in this series we are going to be talking to different local drivers different local teams getting to know them and their cars and hopefully it kind of broadens our horizon in drifting and also helps you guys learn more and more about drifting in general but also the people in drifting so i thought of a million different names for this series but i think we're just going to stick with driftology because after all this is going to be essentially studying drifting itself the people behind it the cars behind it so first up on the chopping block today we are going to be covering my friends over at brake bank and specifically adam one of their drivers who drives the g35 we're here now so we're just going to get into it So before we talk to Adam, make sure and check out this video, or sorry, it might be over here, that I did with Chase Wesley, AKA Close the Gap, where we went along with Brake Bank to Atlanta Motorsport Park, where we attended a July 4th drift event, and we also filmed a kind of like semi-documentary on Brake Bank. So make sure to check that out ahead of this video. That way you have some background before we talk to Adam, which we are gonna do right now. So we are with our first contestant on the chopping block, Mr. Adam from Brake Bank. Just to get a general feel for it, Brake Bank is a group of buddies making drift possible by doing it together, essentially. Essentially? Yeah, to make it easier for everybody. Yeah. I mean, you got this huge shop. I mean, it's a professional grade shop, so you guys do uh, work yeah, as well, Yeah, right? when it comes to like, um, you know, myself, Tyler, and Bryce, we are professionals uh, background in you know automotive industry and uh, fabrication industry so you know i worked for a couple of dealerships i used to work for volkswagen i worked for maserati and ferrari of fort lauderdale and uh, realistically you know to drive drifting uh, and continue for us as a team we felt it was best you know hey we all drive together you know let's uh let's invest in a shop let's get something going and uh you know, our future plans is we definitely want to build some cars for, for other drifters and, um, you know, keep them on track and, and going well. Uh, and as that, we're just pushing our own programs for right now. This year, I decided I really want to push, uh, you know, for my FD license. So U.S. Drift Circuit happened to start their um, Pro-Am series this year. And I was actually looking before they did that, before they announced that, I was going to ship the car out of state. Um, we were going to go to either Tennessee or uh, Texas. Let, let's back up to where it all started. You guys all just casually drifted as buddies back yeah. in the day. Yeah. But nowadays, you're starting to get on the, I would say, the higher tiers of drifting where the fun days are, you know, they've been had. You've had fun at the casual level. And now most of you guys are kind of pushing forward to the next spot. So you yourself personally are doing Pro-Am. And then you have like Leo, for instance, he's at Drift Week right now. So you guys really yeah. are pushing well beyond what a guy probably could do in his garage, like in my situation. And I'll say that's a very popular thing now more and more is drivers getting together, having a common place as a shop and being able to get things done 
in a one house environment since everything you do essentially is yourself on this car, right? Yeah, yeah, essentially like, um, I built this car myself but through its its generations, you know, from getting it from uh, a wrecked G35 with barely an angle kit on it and some coilovers. Uh, I competed at Sebring with the car with a bunch of parts thrown on it and um, actually we did well, we placed third. And then, you know, the next generation of the car came around with the roll cage because I needed it for a specific event. So everything that's been thrown into this car has been because of need, not because of want. It's a, it's a, it's a track, or um, I say it's my seat time car. Right, so the G35 was bought and intended to always be my seat time car so that I can continue press, progressing my driving while I have other builds going on in the background. If you guys remember ever seeing me in my E36 or anything like that, my E36 is kind of on the back burner right now. It's on one of the storage lifts. You know, I do plan on getting to it sometime this year, but right now my main focus is just getting this car through the season. So since it's been my reliable car, you know, it's just, um, been updated into what it is today. So what other competitions have you done prior to Pro-Am? Because when I, when I noticed you driving, and we're gonna put clips in of your driving from the most recent, uh, from the competition last weekend, wasn't it? Yeah, so yep, yep. did you have competition experience prior to that? Because to me, it looked like you were plotting and scheming here and there to where like, it seemed like you had a strategy going so, in. My entire career, like, or my entire driving time I have 10 years of seat time now. Uh, when I first got into drifting, I used to have an NAK S13 and I was 17 years old and I needed my mom to sign off on my waivers for me to drive the track. This yeah, was I didn't even know I didn't even know drifting yeah. was happening, I this think, at in, that point in time. This is in 2012. Right, um, and in Florida as in Florida, well, right? Yeah, in yeah. Florida as well. Uh, we had a small track called County Line Dragway. It's off of, you know, Highway 27. And um, there, uh, drift sessions now, which you guys know to host clutch kickers and all that stuff. Drift sessions used to host our events. Uh, Tim Murphy and um, Ben, uh, we call him Captain Ben, and uh, Chris Jackson was very involved with that too. And, and we took that on to be something that was a skid pad for drivers every other weekend. Like every other Friday or Saturday night, we were allowed to basically go hang out on the skid pad for 25 bucks. Which Imagine is those days. Because you, you yeah. I can't even think yeah. about that now because the most often I think I've been able to drift is like maybe once a month and that was like the, the highest frequency. The highest so frequency like you could actually get Every out. other weekend is absolute insanity. Insane, insane. It, it, when you think about it, like the, the, the skid pad that we had wasn't much. It's probably like half of OSW's skid pad. Yeah, I'll see um, if I can put in something from somebody. We definitely have some pictures yeah. or some old videos of like the, the county line skid pad days. Um, but uh, that, that was some of the best times in my life. I used to get used tires off of Volkswagen Jettas at work yeah. when I was working at Volkswagen. If I'm right, a lot of really talented drivers have come out of that group essentially, yeah. right? Because yeah. wasn't even Chelsea Denofa uh, like Chelsea in Denofa there? used to, used to come, yeah, and he used to like, one of my old friends that got me into drifting, um, you know, he drove with Chelsea Denofa when he had a, a I think he had a Miata. Right, Crazy, and he was yeah. here. He was here in Florida drifting. You got to dig real deep to find pictures yeah, of yeah, Chelsea yeah. and Miata. CFRC <laughs> and all those days. So I kind of grew up and I learned with those guys at a very young age. Right. And um, you know, when I was uh, when we wouldn't do the skid pad events, we would actually do uh, King of County Line competition. Now, King of County Line competition was my very first entry into any sort of competition where I had to qualify. Um, there was a bracket and there was some serious competition. Now, I was in an NAKA. If you guys know Kevin Phillips, Kevin Phillips was one of my friends that I had to battle who had a supercharged 350Z at the time. <laughs> Looking a lot better. Let's see if we can transition around. A little tighter than his first run. And back in 2012, you're like, crazy back then. Yeah. How am I gonna? How yeah. am I gonna do this? The supercharged Z was like a yeah. Super car. So I've always been used to that kind of like low power against more advantageous True. cars. Yeah. Um, sometimes it, it works in your favor. Sometimes it doesn't. I mean, you definitely have a disadvantage. Right. But it can be done. It right. can be done. You can show right. up to the show, and you can you you can you know you can jam. So speaking of getting used to the David and Goliath matchup, so you're very first battle of pro-am competition yeah. was against I, I believe his name is josh love is it josh or joseph it, love joseph love oh. 
Yeah, he was driving in Jonathan Aaron's pro car, or one of his pro cars, uh, and I believe it was a kind of a perfect example of what we're talking about in a sense of, so you have tons of seat time in this car, that you know it extremely well, and you're facing a driver who has 100% of the car, but not necessarily all of the seat time. And you ended up winning that battle, mostly, I think, just due to, he didn't know how to drive that car. Joseph Love is a good driver. Totally, you yeah, know, he, yeah. He's been driving for a long time since, uh, like, in 2016, he had some, like, I think he did Nopi Drift and, like, some other drift competitions. Yep, I looked him up, well. too, and, I, yeah, I saw you know, he, he's, he, he's pretty He's done well in his past and pretty accomplished driver. I just think that he didn't have enough seat time in that chassis. Exactly. In that car with yep. that power setup and yep. to do what he wanted to do, he was struggling on Saturday just, you know, from watching him. He went through, like, two accidents uh, up against the wall, maybe three accidents. I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, him and his team strive really hard to get that car back together. They put Wise Fab on it to get him back into the show, to get him back out, and he threw a qualifying score, and he qualified at 51. That put him in the 17th, 17th position there was only 17 drivers that were able to qualify. So instead of us having a top 16 battle and knocking him out, they decided to put me as the bottom qualifier. I qualified at 58. Um, that put me in the bottom of the 16. So, so now me you at a got to battle a pro yeah, car. <laughs> me, at, uh, me at a 58 and him at a 51. Now I got to battle a pro car, a weapon. Okay, this is a weapon. Yeah, this car for the record, I think I do have a clip of this car at Clutch Kickers being driven by Jonathan Aaron and complete rocket. <laughs> It's a rocket. Yeah. The car's a rocket and it's uh, it, it makes like over a thousand horsepower. It's got the biggest Magnuson supercharger you could put on it. When I was thinking about going against him, a lot of things were playing in my mind, but most of it was playing into his day before and that something bad was gonna happen. Um, and uh, that was more concerning of me than going up against a thousand horsepower car. That's some experience kicking in there There's too, because I think I would have yeah. been shitting my pants saying, Oh my God, it's a pro car, it's a pro car, it's a pro car. Well, well, you've analyzed it and already seen like, okay, he's having issues. I might need to watch how I'm chasing. Right. I might need to make adjustments how I'm driving to right. deal with it. There's something about drifting too, where, okay, the art of drifting is getting a vehicle to slide out and, and accelerate around a corner and be able to still manipulate the car. This is a grip and power balance. This yeah. is not a thousand horsepower and no grip at all because a thousand horsepower no grip at all is slow right so if i have 350 horsepower but i have a lot of grip my car is going to be fast that's what i did I, I low power car a lot of grip it's fast so if you watch the videos i gap all the ls guys and all that stuff because yeah, which is i have crazy. so much grip the car just wants to go and i'm initiating and i'm making it drift i'm, I'm forcing it to drift but in a chase position, it sucked because when I came up on Jonathan, or, or I'm sorry, when I came up on Joseph, Joseph Love, um, or when I came up on my next battle following that, which was uh, Brad, um, I had a really hard time. I had all the proximity, but I had a really hard time keeping the car in drift. Right, and a, and a good amount of power will what? definitely help you with that because you can just kind of you can a, wait behind yeah, them yeah. and just kind of pedal more it power, i could have pedaled right. it more and i could have just spun the tire more and right. maintained drift much easier but that's also i i basically i'm not i'm going to admit it i over gripped the car for the power i have my chase was there i had proximity i had straightened because of the the grip issue through uh right through the center i kind of straightened and reinitiated that zeroed my chase run but you know on his lead he spun because of right. like I think the lack of seat time and the the, the car change because well the and car to went be from... fair on uh, Joseph or Mr. Lo if I'm saying his first name I'm sorry if I'm saying it wrong I'm sorry but to be fair on him extremely hard track to learn for the first time yeah definitely extremely hard car to learn for the first time definitely I would be shitting my pants the entire time and uh, props to him for mostly keeping it off the wall and keeping it in one piece and that's for most of the drivers. Most of the drivers didn't have FD layout tandem experience before this event, and most of them were doing it for the first time, I would say. Yeah, so yeah. it I mean, was a crazy show to watch, and uh, definitely check it out if you guys haven't seen it yet. I've seen, uh, I've seen quite a few of the drivers, like my friends, like Ryan Acevedo and, and um, uh, Billy Mitchell and um, you know a couple of those other guys. Like I've seen them do overruns like 
identical to the FD layout. And they've had some practice. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't even get a chance to do those FD layouts with this car on nitrous. I've slid the oval without it on nitrous, which I could never get up to the wall like I was. So and that was your first time. That was my going first for the wall. time going for the wall. <laughs> that was my first time going for the wall. That's just funny to me because you you look very convicted on some of those runs. I was like, dude, he's done this a million times. Like he's, <laughs> he's throwing it. Thank at you, it. bro. What Thank you. Hell? That was my intention. Like, yeah, I do have a sim at home. Um, I did not play it a lot. I you I literally picked the lowest horsepower car that I could. Happens to be a, a, a Skyline, like an R32, um, from the the uh, Australian drift back. Right. Yep. So I grabbed that car and I went on OSW and I literally practiced for like one night and just kind of was like messing around. I didn't have enough time. I had to get the car ready. Yeah. So, you know, when I went there, I was like, all right, I just, I'm going to, I know where the wall is. I'm going to enter. I see these lines, like the, the zero lines, the dash lines. They want you above those lines. If you can keep your front tires above those lines, you have a good like four feet behind your car to the wall. Right. Yeah. So, if that's a good gauge and you could understand that point of it, full commitment. You go in and you say, all right, that's where I'm putting my car. And as long as you put your car there, you can then you can back it up to the wall. You can get more comfortable with that, that zone. And the tricky thing about the banks is they almost require full commitment, right? Because no, they if, do. if you're not fully committed, it you're just gonna you, wash out, it will right? Yeah, and when you wash out, it will send you into the wall. Right. Because the way the bank is, as you're drifting up the wall, if you were to catch grip and wanna straighten, there's wall in just front of you. sucks you right Yeah, there's the wall, wall in yeah. front of you, but not only that, the bank now wants to take the back of your car down. So as it takes the back of your car down, you're now, you're now faced with that position of, I'm gonna go up to the wall. Yep. My first run, I had half a tank of gas in this and completely forgot about my fuel slosh issue. So I'm up on the bank and as I'm up, as I enter on the bank, all the fuel goes away from my fuel pump. Oh, 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 oh. Bro, my heart sank into my stomach. You feel the power drop because, and because, you just started straight. Oh, oh, all I did, all I could do is grab the handbrake. In that situation, all right. you can do is when you feel that, you have to keep the rear out you, somehow. If you would just watch that run as a regular person, you just see my car go like this like three times up on the bank. But if you understand being in that position, I saved the car from the wall three times. Yeah. Like it was scary. Yeah, I came off the track and I was shaking like this and my friends were like, yo, that was sketchy. Yeah, I was bank like, yo, driving is no drill. Fill the car up, fill the car up. We're going back out with the same commitment. Like we're sending it. So how are, how is everybody able to do this? And what are the, some of the things required on you guys safety wise and on the cars to kind of meet that FD specification be able to run the same layouts be able to do the same things and you know ultimately be considered to move up into right. different leagues right so ultimately what separates any drift car from a formula drift car and that's like i mean any of them is is the safety gear required by their tech rules um that means you have to have an fd spec roll cage starters like so it has to have intrusion bars, the door bars have to be up to spec, all of your material, your welding, everything has to be up to spec by their rules. They make the rules available to everybody, so you can go on Formula Drift's website and you can pick the rule book for what you want to plan to do. If you go for pro, you're good all the way down. So pro spec, you're good, uh, besides like transmission rules, stuff like right. that. There's differences in all of them. Uh, Formula Drift Pro-Am being the easiest rule book to basically start with, because there, they're only worried about safety. Once you get into these higher age, like you look at ProSpec, ProSpec, you need a H pattern transmission. You cannot use a sequential anymore. That's one example. Um, and if you go to Pro, you can use a sequential box. You don't have to use an H pattern. So there's there's different rules. There's also rules about like the car, the makeup. You can't do anything you want. You have to work within their rule book. So pro specifically is generally a little easier to suit your car to, or you know, it doesn't have to have all the bells and whistles but it's all the important things that right. keep you safe all the important stuff that keeps you safe so like in pro-am there's no tire rule right there's no um there's nothing like uh, really limiting your performance of the car so any of our friends that have these drift cars that are out there driving and like as long as your roll cage is up to spec you can add everything else to get into the rules so like, you could have a 200 horsepower 240 as long as it has all the safety gear you there it's just as good as the, yeah. the literal pro car standing next yeah. to you i actually yeah. think um this car is probably the best example of a vehicle with full bolt-ons without swapping an engine without doing anything this has right. a stock power plant in it 
um, and uh, everything that it took to get up to spec is stuff like an external kill switch. So if you see my kill switch is right here. This is uh, in the case of emergency or an accident, they have to kill all the electrical systems in your car. So they're gonna be able to yank that and that now kills all everything in the car. Um, the fire system is a big deal. I always suggest if you're drifting, building a car, whatever, always have a fire, fire, um, any kind of fire extinguisher. What do you call it? Fire extinguisher. Yeah, Thank anything. You. Yeah. Just have a fire extinguisher in have there with you. a couple of them. Yeah. I've seen a few cars You never go know. Up, yeah, so. something will go up in flames and like, yo, you got to put it out if you want to save your car. Right. Um, you know, first save yourself, get out of that thing. Uh, if you can get to your fire extinguisher, get the fire out. Um, so once you move into pro, that, that chance, the level of, of, of that happening is so much higher uh, now in competition that we have to plumb the car with a full fire system. So now there's there's a there's a fire port that sprays on, uh, in the driver's compartment. There's a fire port over the fuel system. There's a fire. There's two fire ports in the engine bay that are going to extinguish any engine fires. Uh, there's a fire in the back over my battery and so my. So the main concern overall, stuff. pretty yeah. clearly with yeah. FD, is safety is number one to get into here. And if you check out right here. So this is going to be how we actually activate our fire system. So with this, you know, whether if I was in an accident, I was unconscious. This is being able to be reached and it's marked right, right. there. So a safety guy could safety come up guy and could pop, come and it, pop it. Yeah, if it's me, if I know the car is on fire, I'm going to pop that. And when I pop that, it's going to flood the car with uh, fire suppression. So Pro-Am, for the most part, pretty achievable then for most people since it's baseline is just get the safety gear down if you can do that then you can start racking up the experience of drifting competition and with some pretty crazy drivers because most definitely so you can definitely get yourself in a field of drivers that are more experienced or that maybe have like those bigger cars that you can challenge yourself you put right. yourself in a position where you're challenged right. um, and that's always going to progress your driving uh, as far it's a lot more than just those two items that make it you know fd legal obviously it has to have an fd spec roll cage um, I originally designed this roll cage without these two pieces in the board in the in the door bar So I had to add those in um, This uh, this seat is required this year. So this has uh, head protection for side impacts um, You also need a Hans device you need a, a spec um, Harnesses, so it's got to be a six-point uh, harness um, So a lot of that stuff is where you're gonna spend all your money like a lot of money goes into just the safety gear and the safety systems to get this thing up to spec for them to be able to look at it and say, all right, your seat's good, your harnesses are good, okay, you have your Hans device, all right, you, you, need, you need race shoes, you need socks, you need um, you know, your full fire suit, of course. Official race car man. Yeah, yeah. you got to be a race car driver. You I think a, that's the good part sock. about it is it emphasizes the safety, take care of that and then drivers can focus on competition beyond right. that. So and that was my whole intention with this car is like, all right, it's basically gone all the way up to a motor swap. Like the only other thing I can do to this car is either, all right, turbocharge the factory engine or maybe add do something to add more power with that. Or I could take that out and put something else that makes more power in right. it. Like a LS or a JZ, you know, whatever that might be. Um, this season, I think I'm gonna stick with my VQ and, and really just push that and, and uh, I think if I would have ran the right tire at OSW, I would have had a completely different experience. If I would have changed tires and ran with accelerators while I was there, right. I would have gone through a completely different experience. But that costs money, and when you're there and you see how, how much you spend just to go to that show, just to show up, it really is about like, all right, let's just drive. Right. You know, let's, let's focus on what I have and the setup that's, that we're doing, and let's just drive. And we're gonna learn everything that we can from this event, and we're gonna apply that to our next event. Because now we have almost two months, not fully. We got about a month and uh, three weeks, um, or now two weeks, but uh, up until um, our next event in, in June, June 4th, it's gonna be at Sebring. So I'm just gonna you know uh, apply what I learned in round one, uh, bring that to round two. We're gonna find out what we learned in round two, and we're gonna apply that to round three and yeah. four. You know, I think as long as you stick on that sort of mental wave of, of just like, I'm doing this for fun, I'm doing it because I love it, and that progression, like, it's just a natural progression. It's about when it, when it's going to happen, not if. True. And, and you know, that's kind of how I'd like to attack it. You know, I mean, it, it might not be everybody's thing, but... <laughs> and I think that's how we all have to justify it with, yeah. the, with the money that we all put into it. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's, 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 it's fun. I'm certainly, I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm ever going to stop as long as I can you know, find it, you know, financially stable. <laughs> right. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So, 
to close off, and this is going to be something I kind of want to ask to everybody that we have on the series. If you could give one piece of advice to a new drifter or, you know, somebody who's seeing it and interested in it, interested in drifting in general, what would be that one piece of advice to give to somebody? You know, they already have a car and all that. Build out the car all the way. I feel like I could go a lot of places with this, but I'm going to keep one it, piece. I'm going to keep it one sweet piece. and simple. Yep, one piece. Keep it off the streets, okay? Go to the track, support your track, like support that, find a learner's day, uh, find a day that you're comfortable. Don't be embarrassed. Do not be embarrassed. We all spin out. We all suck. If you guys remember, we went to a learner's day as well. So I, I, I put myself out there that I suck. It's really not that embarrassing. And uh, overall, no, remember, it's a great experience to learn from and just grow in general with everybody around you. Yeah. It's often what happens. Yeah. You know, so I guess the one piece of advice, just do it as safely as possible. Um, you know, don't get anything that's crazy out of your budget. Find a rear wheel drive car and start learning. Cool. Start learning. That's it. Seat time awesome. is key. Well, I appreciate your time. It was very, very fun chatting with yeah, you. Dude. And uh, absolutely excited to see you at Sebring. So I'll see you then. Oh, yeah, man.